Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Gaylord National Harbor Convention Center outside Washington, D.C., where we're covering DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency's 60th anniversary conference and trade show, one of the world's most innovative organizations, and just an incredible day here full of conferences, uh, but also incredible demonstrations from all of the technology directorates uh, that DARPA's got. And we're talking to uh, Major Amber Walker, who is the Ground X Vehicle Program Manager uh, at DARPA, originally a Signal Corps officer, but now you're in the operations, research, and engineering uh, field. Um, so you've got one of the attention, most att as, as a car guy, a really cool wheel, and we'll talk about your really, really cool wheel in a, in a in a second. But talk to us a little bit about this, you know, amazing vehicle where you know you're showing suspension travel that's just pretty much eye-watering. So talk to us a little bit about your portfolio and some of the technologies that you're trying to develop that are really, you know, could very, very meaningfully shape the future of Army mobility. Sure, so the Ground X Vehicle Technologies Program was designed around four technical areas, two of which uh, we really developed uh, over the last two years. That was mobility and crew augmentation. So the two that you see here today are really getting after how can we be more mobile, therefore more survivable without up armoring, and how can we traverse up to 95% of the world's surface. So this is one way to get after that. This was designed by Pratt & Miller Engineering out of New Hudson, Michigan. Uh, it's about a 12,000 pound demonstrator, seven feet of high travel and low travel suspension. Wow. Uh, and it, they're independently actuated arms. So you can do a lot of fine tuning, 30 degree side slopes. It goes over a Belgian block and frame twister at speeds that we've never experienced before on an army platform. So we're really excited about the potential of this particular demonstrator. Similar, uh, the reconfigurable wheel track that you saw up front is from Carnegie Mellon University's National Robotics and Engineering Center. And again, getting after that 95% metric, it's how can we go from wheel to track and exploit the advantages of both of those contact paths in the right manner at the right time on the right terrain. Um, you know, when you mentioned Car Carnegie Mellon, now it all of a sudden makes sense because the degree of complexity, you're <laughs> like, wow. Uh, you know, like, oh wow, Carnegie Mellon has something uh, to, uh, to do with that. Shout out to you guys, terrific, <laughs> terrific job. Um, Talk to us a little bit about the challenges on the wheel part of this, right? And you know, and you know, you you have it on a Humvee chassis, which you've been testing it. Um, it's a couple of times, it's multiples of what a standard Humvee wheel is. It is. But but talk to us a little bit about the advantages. You said you can increase the contact patch because re regular tire is measured in inches, whereas right. you can modify it. Talk to us a little bit about the technological hurdles you've already gone over. Um, and, and it, but it does appear a little bit of a maintenance nightmare in some respects. I, I could see, I could see any vehicle pool sort of cursing seeing this thing coming at them. But you know, there isn't a technology that the army hasn't refined and, and made usable ultimately. So, so walk to us about you know, the challenges you have to overcome to get to this point and the challenges you have to overcome in order to get it into the field at some point. Sure, so I think uh, the primary challenges that Carnegie Mellon and NREC addressed in the first couple of phases was really twofold. One was how do we take a spinning wheel and stop it on demand and let the track move around it, which is what's necessary for the, the power shift. And then how do we do the shape change, that physical transformation that you see to go from circle to triangle, which enhances the contact path by up to two and a half times. And so that was really the focus of their phase one development efforts. And then they carried that into a more optimized design for phase two. Uh, once we saw those technical challenges addressed, uh, some of it came down to how do we make it reliable? So when you have hydraulics and lots of moving parts, there's very tight tolerances. Um, there's geometry that you have to compete with. How do you make a triangle with the same circumference as a circle, uh, knowing that a tread doesn't really want to flex beyond its, <laughs> its uh, capability? Um, and the tread, I think, is one of the areas of, for future development. So some of the stuff that we observed in early trials is that that tread starts to flex in between the inner and outer roller arms uh, and can start to get pinched and caught. And so how do we improve that lateral stiffness across the tread to prevent that in future variants? I think also just a custom tread design that's better suited for both the wheeled and tracked modes. Uh, obviously when you're developing technology rapidly, uh, you have to keep time and uh, budget in mind. And so we use a lot of commercial off the shelf equipment and then quickly realize 
realized you know, that custom solutions may be better suited to, to later reliability. Um, to your point on, on the reliability and maintainability, I think we have incredible appreciation for the schematics and drawings and uh, the step-by-step -step manufacture of these now and really going in to do process improvement on that, looking at where we can achieve smaller parts counts, lighter weight materials, uh, more readily available manufacturing techniques. We did leverage additive manufacturing to a small degree on that and looking at just those opportunities and trades on materials and, and manufacturing manufacturability I think is really where we would head next. Um, it, it, I have to say it's utterly incredible watching it. I mean it's mesmerizing that you know this giant assembly is spinning like a tire then the track starts spinning around it mm -hmm. then it changes shape mm -hmm. and it all does that fluidly with with one effectively replacement wheel that you can put on a vehicle so I want to follow up on that. Talk to us about sort of the philosophy you guys are applying, right? Because you do want to field this we at do. some point. Um, so talk to us about the applications, because when we were talking before the interview, you said, look, the Army sometimes doesn't know what it's going to do when it gets there. And so this would be a great capability to be able to retrofit in any vehicle that you have out in the field. So talk to us about some of the select applications, right? This isn't something that's going to be out in the field, you know, in, in on every vehicle out there doing the job. but. Talk to us about the select applications you could see, you know, where, where this would really be delivering positive effects for troops. Sure, so I think, uh, you know, the Marine Corps as well as Special Operations both field a very small subset of vehicles where enhancing as much of their performance capability as possible in a small set of vehicles is valuable. Um, I also think looking at something like recovery operations where you're, you know you're going to be getting into dicey terrain or else the vehicle wouldn't need recovered, uh, putting this on larger platforms where potentially that weight differential isn't as penalizing. Uh, there's some specialty uh, applications, certainly in more Arctic environments where snow and hard pack are more uh, likely to occur. Uh, so those are some of the ones that we've been targeting. But all of our DARPA programs start with a problem. And so, you know, our problem was how do we travel more of the earth? And, and that's kind of the core of GXVT. Um, well, I think it's really, really cool. Now let's bring it back to this gorgeous vehicle uh, here. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's amazing. Um, but you also begin to look at it from an Army context, right? You want everything under armor. You generally, generally don't want it. So that's the reason why vehicles fall into kind of an X series of shapes. Mm -hmm. But as, as you look at this, what are elements of this design that you could see you know, having, having a role on future Army vehicles uh, in order to be able to get that better mobility? Because you know, everything is a trade-off, right? The Army was yep. once tracked for a lot of things and then went to wheels for a lot of things, and now it's going back to tracks for some things. Uh, but at the end of the day, anybody who's broken a track knows, <laughs> God, those wheel things are, are really uh, better in some respects. Talk to us a little bit about how some of this technology gets into the field, given the constraints of an armored vehicle. You know, are you know you've got to have things under armor. You got to have stuff that are external. So talk to us a little bit about the thinking on how this technology gets out to the force. Sure. So the first thing I would say is not all vehicles are manned, right? So as we see more of a ubiquitous uh, push for unmanned vehicles, a platform like this becomes more uh, real because you don't have to build around the driver comfort. Now this particular program absolutely was built for driver comfort, it was one of their key metrics, but you can imagine a very high travel suspension on a very capable um, and traversable unmanned system where some of those armor applications just don't apply because you don't have anything to protect. I think the other uh, option here, and I think what you'll see out of Pratt & Miller is precision control and stability. So depending on what kind of payload you're carrying, whether it be kinetic or non-kinetic, if you require precise control and stability of your platform, something that's independently actuated and highly precise can offer that in a way that something like a standard sprung suspension just can't today. Uh, how fast does it go? I don't know what this topped out at, at least 30 miles per hour. But that's got to be fun, even at 30 miles an hour. I think so, I think so. Yeah, I mean, these guys have gone out over some pretty rough terrain at, at well over 25 miles per hour. Um, and, and, you know, come out to tell the tale, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly, I mean, who doesn't want to traverse like the worst terrain in comfort uh, at That's the end right. of the day? Yeah. By the way, those aren't drills in the background, they're, they're drones that are <laughs> flying around over there, becoming generally kind of annoying for, for the conversation. <laughs> one, one last question, when, when you guys are, um, uh, talk to us about that Belgian 
you know, ex explain well, what that Belgian is, block, yeah. the Belgian block, because I think some of our uh, uh, viewers might not know exactly what that is, but that's actually a pretty significant thing to mount. Sure, yeah, so there's a number of different operational tests in, in evaluation environments under uh, standard ground vehicle testing, and so we had the privilege of taking most of our demonstrators out to the Aberdeen Test Center back in May. There is a YouTube video on DARPA TV that can kind of helps you picture some of what we're talking about here today. But the Belgian block and frame twister are both, there's deep V ditches, there's 30 degree side slopes, and then there's these undulating kind of rolling balls that, that force your, your frame up and in, 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 in a uncomfortable way. And so something like this can remain almost entirely level over it. It doesn't look like it's even trying. Uh, it's really, you can't tell how fast it's going in the video, but it really is quite impressive to those in the vehicle community who see things traverse that every day. Yes, and having been over stuff like that and getting bounced around like a ping pong ball on the inside, it's remarkably uncomfortable. Sure. Major Amber Walker, thank you very much. The Ground X uh, Vehicle Technology Program Manager at DARPA. Thank you so much. Best of luck on the program. Thank you. My pleasure.